Right. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for um, for inviting me to this uh, meeting, and it's uh, my job to deliver the very last talk. So I'm glad there's a few people left in the audience. Um, so I'm a director of evaluation at the Medical Research Council, but I also have a number of roles in the Research Councils UK as well, the umbrella organisation for all seven um, research councils in the UK. So I'm the um, loan funder representative on the on the programme. And um, I hope I've got the title right because I want to talk about um, our efforts to capture and understand impact. And this is really where we want to major. I, I've heard a lot about measurement and whether we should measure or shouldn't measure which, and so on. What are we doing? But our main objective is to better understand how research leads to impact. And, um, and maybe there's a bit of a feedback loop there because if we can understand a little bit more about research activities and about how they lead to impact, it may well be that we can corroborate or support or question peer review a bit more. And so I, I kind of see that feedback loop as, uh, as important. So um, Rand Europe, a few years ago, about four or five years ago, did some uh, nice little sort of summary of evaluation frameworks and um, set out that um, the reason why we evaluate is usually around four things all rather conveniently starting with A. So the four A's were about analysis and learning, better understand research activity. Maybe in the far-flung future, we might have the potential to maybe do some things that maximize the return. And, and I'd, I'd like to try and show you some of the things that maybe give us a, a little bit of a, uh, an insight into that. Accountability. You know, we have to make regular representations to our parent uh, government department, the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills, and we have to explain, usually to an entirely new lineup of people in biz, because they turn over quite quickly, um, you know, right from scratch, what we do, how we do it, and how it might be a good thing to continue doing that. We, um, you know, that then <coughs> blurs into some advocacy, because we need to explain our delivery and make the case for continued funding. And there are some, a few examples where being able to, um, to have ready evidence about the progress, productivity, and the quality of research has made the difference between ministers deciding to go and invest in one area or to allocate more funds to science funding. And so I think we've made a little bit of a difference. And actually allocation, um, as I say, I think this largely we rely on peer review and our panels of experts and boards of experts in the MRC. We have a really strong um, strategy board which sets um, high level um, direction and, um, and allocates funding to big cross-cutting sort of themes. So, um, so largely we're, we're dependent upon those group of experts and the wider advice that they get. But... Um, we would, we would really like to be able to find evidence that would either, let's say, corroborate that or support it or modify it in some way. So there's a huge number of, of challenges. I've said here measurement, but I mean a huge number of challenges about trying to track things in qualitative or quantitative ways. Um, I'll say a little bit about uh, trying to establish the link, this causal link between one step in the process to the other. I think we're really struggling with a lot of that. And there's some great models from, uh, from the humanities, actually, in the social sciences that has helped us understand the fact that the translation of research is not a linear process. Um, we refer to things like the chain link uh, model by Klein and Rosenberg, but also Buxton and Hannay's payback model, um, looking at the way in which research, um, new knowledge translates into new products and processes. And those, the, the knowledge of implementing those products and processes feeds back into new discovery science. And there's a lot of other challenges. You'd be well, many of you will be well aware of all of these things. Attribution, how do we, we, we link that um, benefit to, to a particular funding input? We're living in a, in a situation where clearly science is entirely global. So we're often focused in on the UK, but of course we're getting a huge number of spillover effects from, from international research and we're contributing to, to the global um, progress. And timescales. In the MRC, of course, we're clearly very aware of the time it takes for, um, for research to translate into new clinical interventions. We measure that in decades, really. 
So we've got to try and um, ca you know, ca slowly see changes that, that are sometimes quite um, difficult to detect on the timescales we're working on. So we have kind of, um, you know, we have put together logic models and they usually are kind of based on inputs, processes, outputs and so on. And we look at, um, you know, the fact that inputs would be for a funder, funding interventions. Um, maybe there will be some outputs that we can link to that. They might lead by some mysterious way into, into new impacts. Um, but we really understand very, very little of this. Almost nothing, really. Um, and I'll, I'll just illustrate the fact that we don't even do a very good job of knowing a lot about the inputs. Because when it comes to who funds health research, where, how much, and on what, we struggle to even do that in the UK. We struggle to actually capture good details on who funds medical research, where, and what are they doing? What are the objectives of those studies? And maybe that's a, that's a product of, of us having a really healthy ecosystem in the UK where we have a lot of charitable investment, a lot of, um, a lot of government investment, and, and, um, and other you know, public funders. So, um, so we, we do an exercise every five years where we try and survey what um, health relevant research is done in the UK. And we get around, um, uh, last time we got around £8 billion spent from the private sector, the charitable sector and the, and the public sector. But that's a huge amount of effort to try and do that. A lot of the information is not in the public domain about who is funding what and where. We try and do this on a, on a global basis. There's some um, projects uh, supported by WHO and NIH, um, called World Report, and we're hoping that over the next few years, what we've been doing in the UK to try and get um, the portfolios of funders more openly accessible might translate into something where we can see internationally who spends uh, what on health research and where. And actually, I'd like to, my objective would be to say, actually, who funds research where, how, and, and on what? Because... Actually, you know, we're obviously in the MRC, we, we tend to focus in on the health research. It's a problem, I think, shared across all the sectors. You know, do we really have a global um, research portfolio? Particularly as private sector is always an important part of this picture, and we'll probably never get transparency over where they're putting their R&D. So we need more research to help us sort out this. And um, the MRC has, for a number of years, been putting um, commitment to um, what we're calling strategic evaluation research. So um, sometimes people refer to it as science of science policy. Um, you know, where we need, where we, we it's, the, it's the unknown unknowns. We need to go out there and discover, actually. So we need smart academics in all sorts of disciplines. And we're particularly interested in economists and social scientists to come to us with ideas about how to advance the field. We funded seven small studies in this area over the last couple of years to, um, to, to, to try and advance the field. And I think um, we've made some progress. Uh, one study that preceded our, our these, these funding initiatives, where we've committed a million pounds to these seven studies, was the Medical Research What's It Worth study. So this really, for the first time, got some credible <coughs> evidence together about what was the, re the return on investment from medical research. And to, de to determine this, you need to know, if you're looking at impact in terms of health gain, you need to know, as I said, the inputs into the system. You need to know how long it took for those to change <laughs> clinical practice. You need good markers of those changes in clinical practice. And you need data, in this case from the health service, about who received those new interventions and how much benefit they received from them. So this study in 2008 really put together a lot of that picture. And it was really great that Ewan mentioned uh, clinical guidelines because for a number of years we've been looking at these as a really great marker on this pathway to, to, to impact. And so um, the, the results of that study set out that there was an internal rate of return of 9% in terms of health gain. Basically, the UK had invested 2 billion in cardiovascular disease. 
um, and that had resulted in 22 million patients receiving benefits and a net monetized health gain of 53 billion pounds. So you get, if you crunch all those figures, an internal rate of return of 9%. <coughs> Of course, that's health gain is only one aspect of impact from health-relevant research. There are the wider economic gains from that research spilling over into other, other sectors. And so there's been some studies looking at the elasticity, the correlation between public and charitable health R&D and, for instance, pharmaceutical and biomedical um, decisions to invest in, in research and development. And we've funded a study which has um, updated a lot of the data in this, um, in this area, and it's, it's almost ready for publication. It's out for peer review, so I haven't put the internal rate of return at the bottom there, but that'll be coming out um, very soon. Um, previous literature searches had looked at the spillover benefit at being about 30%. So I think these are really important. And also, we're now talking the language of Treasury, which is very much, at the current time, the kind of meetings that we're having with government. Another important issue, and this was one of the first studies that was, um, was published from, um, from our, uh, this, this latest initiative on economic impact, was the question over um, how long does it take for research to translate? And to do that, you need better, more consistent markers. So in a clinical study, you might have um, ethical approval for a clinical study to go ahead. Then you might have recruitment of the first patient. And then you might have conclusion of the study marked by the, the, um, the, the, the publication at the end of the study. Then you might have um, it impacting in some way on clinical guidelines. Those clinical guidelines might come before or after changes in clinical practice. So there's a whole area of work to be done um, in getting better markers of progress. And what was really nice, in, in, and this, I, I urge you to have a look at Stephen Hannay's study because it's a really interesting read because it includes some really excellent case studies, very well-researched case studies, um, and, um, and it really tells a, a great story of translation. And it starts to give us some idea of what might be important and there's, so that might not be entirely generalizable, but I think it certainly it's taught us some things about, in this case, clinical research. And we did um, some of my colleagues um, in the Department of Health and the Wellcome Trust, also again looking at clinical guidelines, tried to look to see if we could um, start to sort out the relative contribution of funders to various clinical guidelines wasn't terribly successful, but it generated some data, generated a peer review publication, and some interesting discussion. And what this does is it, it, it I mean, we, we know that MRC research is making an impact. Um, we can pick out of um, REF case studies, which are, you know, a, a great effort being put into gathering uh, evidence and data about the progress productivity of a particular piece of research or set the collaboration or um, uh, body of research leading to a particular impact. Um, and it w what was interesting was that, um, was that when we read through the REF case studies, because we have over the last few years increased the volume of feedback from our researchers about the work um, and what it is delivering, um, there wasn't any surprises in those REF case studies. We knew all of those impacts already. And one important conclusion, I think, from the analysis of REF case studies was that clearly we need to be more efficient and more structured about the way in which we gather and record this information from the, um, the progress, productivity, and quality of research. Um, and wherever possible, we need to reuse this data, share it, make it openly available so that various people can um, have a, a view of it and, and analyze it. What we have done um, since 2007, actually, is try and put in place an online approach for researchers to feedback to us about the pro progress, productivity, and quality of their work. Lots of different outputs. We were interested in a lot of things apart from publications. I think we were, we were interested in widening the, in, the, the debate about outputs out of 
just patents and papers, which it was largely focused on at that time. So we're interested in, um, you know, uh, we're interested in the influence that research has on policy. We're interested in um, where it has failed to generate an output, actually, by any of our categories. Um, we're interested in that. But we're interested in tracing the interactions between the producers and the users of research by connecting these steps in the pathway. So what uh, this, the online system is now called ResearchFish, and ResearchFish is used by 100 um, research organisations in the UK, and now also research organisations in Denmark and in Canada, and there are other countries coming on stream. And in the UK, uh, we've managed for, since 2006 uh, a, a tribute, 1.1 uh, million outputs, half of those being publication outputs, but half of them being uh, descriptions and facts and figures about other sorts of outcomes and outputs attached to uh, our funding references. Um, and it all adds up to about £40 billion of research investment. So this is about a, it's about a structured, prospective data set on research uh, productivity progress. And we use that to communicate the benefits of research. We use it in our evaluation programs. And we use it to better understand what leads to impact. And we're nowhere near there yet. Some things that have made an impact from our studies of progress of, of research um, investable opportunities we have a section in research fish which looks at trying to capture in a structured way the development of new products and interventions and this um, may, had a major part to play in the uh, the research councils obtaining another 90 million pounds of investment in the biomedical catalyst so these things can make it it was just timely we were talking to the right person at the right time, but with the right evidence. That's what makes the difference. We understand a lot more about the, the diversity and the, um, and, the, uh, and the content of collaborations. I'm quite interested in this because this was a different way of approaching it. Asking the researchers directly was different to looking at co-author analysis. Um, you know, that's often a proxy for collaboration, but it only captures part of the collaborations that are ongoing. And what we're interested in is, you know, when does that collaboration start and end, and what does it involve? Does it involve sharing of expertise, facilities, staff, etc.? Um, and and I, th I think we're 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 getting much more of an insight into collaboration by using this sort of feedback. We're interested in the kind of research infrastructure that is important for the research that we fund. So we ask researchers, what infrastructures are you using and how are you using them? And this is really important to the, la the research landscape in the UK. Um, here we have cross-council data, um, not a huge amount of feedback, only about 1,500 researchers filled in this section, but gave us 5,000 data points, not a bad survey. Um, and um, from this, um, we, we see a little bit of ascertainment bias because it's a lot of uh, so still bias towards the MRC, but the other councils are getting their communities to, to, to feed information through this, this approach. We have the diamond synchrotron being the most widely used um, <coughs> infrastructure in the UK, but we also get quite a lot of information about international infrastructures that are important. So, you know, when we're considering whether we should continue to subscribe to an international infrastructure. This is quite useful evidence for us to, to consider that. Inward investment, this is, this is such a complex issue because um, you've got lag times, you've got to make sure you have defined your input population of grants very carefully. You've got to know that you understand how people have expressed the funding that's coming in from their to their lab um, from other sources. But we're already starting to discover some interesting things. For instance, you know, it takes about four years for um, uh, after giving uh, a research team a grant for them to have generated the maximum return through funding um, from other sources um, to, to that lab. So it's, it's, good, it's, it's good in that we're, we're 
able to engage in that discussion about leverage, which government saw as a much more simple um, picture before we did this, this work. Interdisciplinarity. This is a really hot topic with the nurse review going on and the last triennial review of the research councils um, you know, picking up a perception that we weren't supporting interdisciplinary work um, well enough. There was no definition of interdisciplinarity set out in those kinds of reviews. So we need better ways to identify and compare levels of interdisciplinarity. And we can start to do that with some publication data. Um, so we've, we've been really interested in picking up some really uh, great techniques by, um, uh, put out by Eshmael Raffal from Sussex University <coughs> on mapping um, disciplines. And we're interested in, so we're interested in, people come to us with grant applications and they obviously describe a piece of work which might involve various disciplines. So there's information there about what they s are setting out to do um, and how they are setting out to involve w um, people with other skills and other expertise. When that work gives rise to publication outputs, those publication outputs include a description of the work done and therefore the kinds of expertise, methods, materials and, discipline and other expertise that, um, that they've, they've brought into that work. Those outputs cite other articles, so you can say something about the body of knowledge that those people have drawn upon to create that paper. And then others cite those, um, those papers, and therefore you can say something about the way those ideas are being transmitted to other communities. And this is, just looking at this very briefly, has really set out some interesting um, examples, because we, we, we love using this structured data as a finding aid, and, um, and this has given us examples where MRC-funded research has had an impact in uh, the, you know, historical research, has had an impact in music, and so on. So those are really interesting ways of finding that out. And I could go on about how we take that structured data and build it into an impact case study. So we can take the, the fact that a new product or intervention has been described but because it's linked to all the funding sources, it's linked to all the collaborations, and it's linked to all the patents and papers, we can start to look at under the hood and look at that, how that product or intervention has been developed, what the other inputs have been important. And this is um, just, I'd, I'd love to tell you about the development of something called the Cytosponge sponge in Cambridge, which is a, making a real difference, it will make a real difference to the way in which people are uh, screened for um, esophageal cancer. But I'll skip through that because I'm coming to the end of my time. So we've used the data extensively. It's important for us to have structured information, but we're not majoring on trying to um, somehow calculate uh, the ideal metric. What we're using it for is a structured way of f getting quickly to the information about our research and the, what it's delivering. So next steps, I think, um, uh, from our point of view, there's no way comprehensive, but um, we need to solve that input problem. You know, there needs to be global, openly accessible, authoritative sources on public and charitable funded research. We'll never get it for the private sector. That's, um, we, we understand that. But we should have it for public and charitable funded research. After all, that's taxpayers' money through two different routes, but it's, it should be out there. We should encourage grant paper attributions to be, well, in fact, we should probably require it to be fully recorded at the start. I love the presentation about the, uh, the XML to PDF publishing and so on. Let's get all the right data in the paper at the start. Let's not add it post-publication and waste a lot of researcher time in doing that. Let's, let's get it right in at the start. We will continue to collect prospectively output data and we'll continue to collaborate across funders and I hope across universities and so on to exchange that data and provide it as openly accessible as we can. The research councils publish out all of the data that they collect as soon as we possibly can. ResearchFish will integrate with ORCID. They've signed the um, agreement that will be done before the end of the year. Um, 
I'd love to understand what benefits that will bring, but um, yeah, I'm sure it will. Um, we're linked to other sources to join up um, uh, data such as patents and tri clinical trials and so on. And uh, we'll obviously continue to, to increase the ease of use of research fish or whatever system comes after it. Um, and we need to expand the support for academic research on the science of science policy. We're going to look again at this area later this year, and I'd like to see another million, or maybe two or three million, going into this area across funders, because I think it's really, really important that we understand what leads to impact. Thank you very much.